Good morning, black people. Good morning. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to DrBoysTV.com, the home for intelligent black people. As you come in, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Uh, just a reminder, this podcast is on Spotify. So you go to Spotify, you look up Boyce Watkins, you can find my podcast, The Dr. Boyce Breakdown, where I can allow you to, um, or where you can allow yourself to listen to this podcast as opposed to just simply watch. Uh, those of you who are watching online will notice that I am not actually able to uh, show my face today. Why? Well, because I'm traveling and hotels have crappy Wi-Fi. So because the crappy Wi-Fi might disrupt the podcast, I thought that I would just simply come in here and do an audio conversation about a very important issue. So as you come in, please shout out the city that you're from. I want to say good morning to Yoshika Williams Garner. Yoshika, I see you here every day and I love you and I appreciate you. Uh, people like you are what is going to bring the black community back to prominence. Uh, and also, if, as you come in, please hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Um, so anyway, let me hop into this topic for today. So the topic that I wanted to really cover is uh, this takeover that's happening. Uh, it's starting in places like Atlanta, uh, and it's a takeover of corporations that are just buying thousands and thousands and thousands of houses. So Lori Williams from, from Chicago and Danielle from Dallas, you should know that corporations are just really kind of devouring the single family home market right now. Uh, in fact, it's, it's uh, mostly happening in Atlanta and or Atlanta was the centerpiece of this conversation. I grabbed some excerpts from an Atlanta Journal Constitution article I'm gonna share with you. Uh, but give me a yes, give me a yes in the chat. How many of you have noticed corporations just scooping up houses and they, and when corporations operate, uh, and, and I talk about this a lot in my book, the, the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power, which is on Amazon. Uh, you know, corporations are basically what I call an economic gang. They're gang affiliated. And uh, in the way gangs operate is they operate as large groups of people. They come in and do more than an individual person can do. They kind of go around and they sort of exert their power. Maybe they bully other people, right? And I'm not just talking about like the Crips and the Bloods and all that. I'm talking about the police department. That's a big, that's a big gang. Uh, the uh, NAFTA, NAFTA is an economic gang. Uh, Apple, Apple, the corporation Apple is an economic gang. Uh, and gang affiliation is how people built wealth throughout the world. Uh, you know, that's why when people talk about the Rothschilds, it's not like they talk about, you know, Daniel Rothschild or Jane Rothschild or Cynthia Rothschild. They're not talking about a single Rothschild. The Rothschild is, the Rothschilds are not a single person. The Rothschilds, are an economic gang. So effectively, uh, if you want to build wealth, you got to understand most wealth building is gang affiliated. That's why black people, when they wanted to design this country so that you would never have anything, they destroyed your families. So all this uh, gender war, uh, black men and black women hating each other, fighting over who's going to take care of the kids, uh, you need to stop all that nonsense because not uh, strengthening your families is going to keep you broke. People who don't learn this are going to be broke in the next generation and the next and the next and the next. So let's break those cycles, okay? This is very important. So anyway, here's the point. In Atlanta right now, and this is happening all throughout the country, these single-family homes are being devoured by corporations. I grabbed some uh, excerpts from the Atlanta, Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, article on this topic, and uh, I'm going to try to put them up in order, and I hope you can read them. So uh, here is the... Um, Here's one. Uh, these are screenshots from the Atlanta Journal Constitution where they talk about this issue. So the first thing that they say is that instead of building wealth for residents, these homes are now a vehicle for corporate profits. So effectively, corporations are realizing something that you've realized for a long time, which hopefully you've realized this, that owning real estate is a great way for pro a pathway to profitability. It's a great way to build wealth. Uh, home ownership, according to most studies, uh, the, you know, again, I'm, I'm a finance professor, so all we do is sit around and read research papers and analyze data. The data says, the research says, that home ownership is the number one pathway for people to go from poverty to middle class. That is literally the pathway. That's the, 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 the way and the method. And so now they're sort of taking this away. Corporations are saying, hey, you know what, we want to get in this game too. And what happens is that when corporations start bidding on these houses and you get a bunch of bidders for these houses, what does that do to the price? What do y'all think? What do you think that having suddenly having all these economic gangs uh, showing up, you know, like it's like it's an economic freaknik, literally they're, they're, they're descending on cities like Atlanta, they're descending on cities like Detroit, they're descending on cities like Chicago. What do you think happens to the prices of houses in those cities 
where these economic gangs come in and devour up all the property. Daniel Williams from San Antonio, Texas, and Laverius Johnson from Miami, Florida. What do you think the source from Brooklyn? By the way, we decided we're going to do a, a Black Wealth Summit in Brooklyn. So uh, I'll let you guys know the date when it happens. What do y'all think? What do you think happens to the price of rent when they start devouring up all these properties? Do you think the price of rent goes up or goes down? What do y'all think? Answer me in the chat. What do y'all think? Okay, Andre says, uh, I'm a realtor in Indiana. Let's invest here and make it happen. I'm going to put that on the screen, man. I love that. I love it. He's a, he's, uh, Andrew, Andre, you a man of action, brother. I respect you. So I'm going to put that comment on the chat. So so y'all send him an inbox and uh, talk to this brother. All right, so, so yeah, the prices go up. They skyrocket. And uh, let me tell you, my wife and I bought a house in Atlanta around 2021. And we had to bid like crazy to get this house. We had to fight for the house. Like we had to hurry up and rush and run to the phone and run to the mailbox and send the wire the money as soon as possible and fill out the forms by you know by six o'clock tonight. We had to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. I got to beg somebody to take my money. I have to fight to get a chance to pay my money. This is crazy to me. Same thing happened in Chicago. We bought a property in Chicago. And our realtor, you know, cool sister who was giving us the hookup was telling us, she said, look, you know, a lot of these Chinese investors are coming in and they're just buying up the entire block. They're buying up entire floors of this building. She said, so if y'all want to get in, y'all better move. Y'all better move. So effectively, what I'm saying to you guys is that this is kind of the real estate game is really shifting. It's really getting um, interesting. And I, and I don't and, and I don't think this is good. I I, I wish those politicians in Atlanta would stop this. They need to pass some laws to keep corporations from coming in and eating up all of the food, the economic food. And, I, and actually, if you stick around to the end, I'm going to talk about a couple of ways I think you can uh, fight through this issue. Before I do that, please hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, share, subscribe. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins. Uh, I'm a finance PhD. That's what I do. In case you guys don't know, uh, the other day I did a uh, discussion about reparations. We talk about things like that. Today, we're talking about the big takeover involving corporations buying up tons and tons of real estate. Uh, the Black Business School's URL is right there. We've helped over 10 million people, 10 million people buy their first share of stock, and you can get started for free. So uh, feel free to go to theblackbusinessschool.com. We have trainings for the entire family. Uh, one of the ways that Black intelligent Black people are going to run the world in the next 40 years, by the year 2070, the year 2070, that's my magic year, by the year 2070, intelligent black people will be running the world because we're doing something nobody else is doing. We are educating our kids on economics to the point where we've got seven-year-olds who can now do finance and understand investing at a college level. That's epic. That's life-changing. I know this works because my PhD is in this stuff, so I know what I'm talking about. So feel free to go to theblackbusinessschool.com. We have 160,000 students now. Uh, you can get started for free. Come hang out with us. All right. So anyway, let me keep going here. So so the next thing from this Atlanta Journal and Constitution article, uh, they, they sort of put up some screenshots of uh, different statements they were making. And uh, I don't want to get I want to give them credit for doing a great story on this, because I think the story needs to be told. They said some investment groups own dozens of homes. So they said that some of these groups and uh, and what's interesting is that you, when they talk about these groups, they're not just talking about major corporations. I believe they're also talking about groups like um, Julian Gordon, in case you don't know, Julian Gordon is the dean of real estate in the Black Business School. He also runs the Freedom School. And Julian Gordon uh, is running a massive multifamily home ownership movement that uh, is impacting uh, Black people around the world. Literally, Julian and his group, Julian is not, he's not a rap star. He's not a, 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 a some celebrity guy on TV. He's not some person who got a bunch of funding from one. Uh, to go and start a hedge fund. Uh, he's not, you know, he's not Oprah Winfrey. He's not in that category. He's just a black person that loves black people. And let me tell you what Julian did. Julian did something that uh, no celebrity, no politician uh, has ever done. No celebrity. Jay-Z can't say he did it. Oprah can't say she did it. Uh, LeBron can't even say he did it. Nobody, no, nobody can say he did this. What Julian did was he helped black families acquire $267 million worth of real estate. He's literally helped black families acquire a quarter billion dollars worth of real estate, a quarter billion dollars. There's nobody else that can say that. So Julian, uh, his group actually goes and they form their own economic game. They go around and they buy property and they're doing it on our behalf. You see, here's the thing. Here's what you got to understand. Gangland is not going away. You know, gangland is not going away. This is that Ice-T movie, Colors, 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 right? Gang affiliation is not going away. Economic gangs will always be a part of a capitalist society. 
But the reason I love Julian and have so much respect for him, he, he is my brother, is because he just has a gang that's actually working on behalf of black people. You know, I, I have vetted this guy. I've worked with him for six years, and I just really, I've loved him ever since I met him for the first time in 2017. And since that time, I have seen him do some amazing things in terms of forming solutions that have gotten things done. Uh, and so so really, you know, when you talk about kind of, uh, you know, three of us that, that I think are doing, that, that are doing our best, that, that have accomplished something in this space, uh, you know, in the Black Business School, we've helped over 10 million people buy their first share of stock. Julian, uh, with uh, the, within the Black Business School and within the Freedom School, has helped uh, Black people acquire over a quarter billion dollars worth of real estate. Lamar Tyler has probably created more Black millionaires than anybody I know. Lamar Tyler, he runs Traffic Sales and Profit. I love this guy. I respect these guys immensely. These are solution-oriented people. So here's the thing. I want you to understand this. When I talk about this issue, I'm not here to whine. You know, winning is not the same as whining. We talked about this yesterday when we were talking about uh, how to be a relationship guru and how uh, all these platforms get formed by people that just sit around and whine and cry all day. Winning is not the same as whining. They're not spelled the same. One is W-I-N-N-I-N-G. The other one is W-H-I-N-I-N-G. And some people get mistake the two. They think that whining is just like winning. Well, the reality is that if you want to win this game, you're going to have to probably become gang affiliated on some level. Here's a couple of ways you can become gang affiliated. Well, number one, I talked about what Julian's doing, what we're doing in the Black Business School. We've got a gang of 160,000 black people that are in the Black Business School. You can get started for free. Uh, we also got millions of people around the world that are connected to our movement. Uh, you talk about gang affiliation, Lamar Tyler gathering up, you know, dozens of black millionaires who are doing epic work, uh, you know, but then also another way to be part of the gang and to benefit from all this is to actually invest in some of these real estate investment trusts. Uh, you can look up on any app, you can get into your Robinhood app, Acorn, Stash, whatever, and you can go in there and you can buy shares of these real estate investment trusts. There are entire mutual funds and, and entire, uh, you know, collectives of real estate investors that you can invest in in the next five minutes if you wanted to. It's not hard to do. It doesn't take a ton of paperwork. It doesn't take a ton of legwork. Because let me tell you the truth about real estate that's really interesting. Um, my wife and I have owned property for a while. We don't really like it that much. You know, and it's not to say I hate it. I'm not saying I hate it. I like it. You know, legacy, generational wealth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, all this. Okay, important. We know this. We know these things are important. But sometimes it's a pain in the butt. Like, I don't know if anybody else is a real estate investor, but... Uh, you know, if, if, has anybody ever felt that where maybe you're just like, man, owning this property is a pain and it's hard. It gets on my nerves and I got to deal with all these people and all this other nonsense. Right. So, you know, when I, when I go into places um, like, for example, when I've been on the Breakfast Club and stuff like that, one of the things that I've talked about extensively is that when it comes to investing, you kind of have to get in where you fit in. And every method of making money is not always good for you. All money ain't good money. You know, all money ain't good money. And, and what that means is that not just that you shouldn't sell your soul for money, uh, it also means that you shouldn't do things like destroy your health for money uh, because then you'll lose all your all your money because you're going to have to give all your money back to the pharmaceutical companies and the hospitals. Uh, it also means you shouldn't destroy your relationships for money. But then on top of that, you shouldn't destroy your happiness for money. So when I talk to you guys about different investment vehicles, just understand the reason financial literacy is critical for our people. The reason it is the most important thing we can do in this generation is not just because other people use their money to enslave you and, is, and they want to enslave your children. Your children are next if you don't protect them. If you don't protect your kids, your kids will become corporate slaves. But in addition to that, uh, when, when you are able to understand all the different ways to make money, you can pick the method that works for you. One thing that you should understand about real estate is that there are a ton of ways to get involved with real estate that doesn't involve you being a landlord. You know, in fact, there's a million ways for you to make money without working. If you go to my website, boycewalkins.com, I have a free training right there called How to Make Money Without Working. And I and, and just to give you a foreshadow, I go deep into how I make my money every week with stock options. So so I'm not here to say that there's one way to skin this cat. I'm just saying that you better skin the damn cat before the cat eats you and your kids. You better skin the cat before it claws your eyes out. You better skin that cat before before you find yourself being victimized by all of this because we got people that love to see us as victims. You got people that love to train us to be victims. They, they, they train you to be reactive and not proactive. See, gentrification, if you had re, if you had been proactive with gentrification, you would have owned all that land so that when the white folks showed up to buy all that property back, you could have sold it to them at a premium if you wanted to. 
If you were proactive on gentrification, gentrification could have made you rich, but you were reactive. You sat there on the best property in the city, and because white folks had not recognized it was the best property, you did not recognize it was the best, best property. You were waiting for other people to validate the value of your property before you believed how valuable it was to have a, a house that was right next to the lakefront. You didn't know that. You didn't know that, that having property right next to downtown was really meaningful. You just thought it was worthless because, because white folks never told you that it was valuable. Then when they decide it's valuable and they bid up the price, then, and you, you get mad because they, they take it and they buy it or whatever, and you've been a renter the whole time, so you don't benefit from it, and then you get mad about it. So I'm saying to you that if you talk about investing, the biggest thing about investing that really is against the current culture that's heavily promoted is you must be proactive instead of reactive. The person who gets there first is the person that's going to win. Now, do me a favor. Please hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, share, subscribe. Uh, Renee, uh, the, pot, the broadcast Julian did last week, I think it might be on my channel somewhere. <clears throat> um, maybe you can check the content from last week. Uh, it is going to be taken down, though, so you may want to watch it soon. So if you look, uh, I can't remember the title of it, though, but if you scroll down through the last, say, 10, 15 videos I've done, you'll, you should see uh, Julian's uh, content up there. Uh, do me a favor. Hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, share, subscribe. I want to remind you I have a new book out. It's an Amazon bestseller, best book I've ever written. Read the reviews or just go read the reviews. 90% of the reviews are five star. It's called The Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power. My goal is to have this in the hands of every single black family that will listen. Uh, these are 10 simple rules and steps that any family can put into place that will create a legacy of generational wealth and economic power that is beyond your wildest dreams. You will literally put your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids in the driver's seat uh, they're not going to be complaining about racism. They're going to be taught their, their biggest complaint is going to be how much money they're going to have to pay in taxes because their wealth has accumulated at such a high level. I know these things well. My PhD is in finance. I've been working on financial, high level financial problems for about 30 years now. I taught at Syracuse University, et cetera. You guys know my background. I'm not going to repeat it too much, but I have to repeat it for new people who just think I'm some guy running his mouth on the Internet. And the book is available on Amazon. So feel free to go take a look at the book. And also we did a Blackwell Summit last week in Dallas where we actually went into detail on how to implement each of the Ten Commandments, and it was really amazing. So we're going to do one more Blackwell Summit. I decided I wanted to do um, Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn's going to be the city that we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have the All Black National Convention in Atlanta. That's going to be October 20th. If you go to allblacknationalconvention.com, you can go and lock in your passes. I'm going to just tell you, we've sold about 70% of the available passes already, uh, and we don't want there to be a big crowd. We're not trying to create some massive convention that has you know 10,000 people there. I like the small, intimate feel. It's like a black family reunion. So we're capping our ticket sales at about 800 or so, and we're probably at about five to 600 already. So uh, you may want to lock in your, your your situation right now by going to allblacknationalconvention.com. You can also be a vendor or a sponsor if you want some marketing for your business. It's totally up to you. All right, so let me, uh, let me jump back in here and talk about this. So let me share the next slide that um, Atlanta Journal-Constitution shared about the fact that these corporations are buying up all the houses, and this is really making it difficult for regular people to afford houses. So let me read this. They said, in the wake of the Great Recession, investors have scooped up thousands of single-family homes across Metro Atlanta. So they're talking specifically about Atlanta, but this is also happening in Philadelphia. This is also happening in Chicago. This is also happening in Detroit. This is also happening in New York. This is also happening in Los Angeles. This is also happening in Birmingham. This is also happening in Louisville. This is also happening in Houston. This is also happening in Tulsa. So what I really want you to understand is that this is happening all over the country. This isn't just Atlanta. So uh, the other thing that they said here is they said they compete against families for a limited supply in all but the wealthiest neighborhoods. Uh, that's interesting. I, 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 you know, I'd be curious to know why they don't go after the wealthiest neighborhoods. But you know why? You know what? I, I, why did I, boys, stop asking dumb questions when you already know the answer to the question. Why do you think they're not going after the wealthiest neighborhoods? I'm going to ask you this. Why, why do you think, let's just do a little financial trivia right quick. Why do you think, answer in the chat, <clears throat> why do you think that they're not able to gobble up property in the wealthiest neighborhoods? I'll let you answer. I'll wait. What do y'all think? What do you think? Why do you think? You think it's because white folks live there? Well, yeah, but white folks live in poor neighborhoods too. And also uh, black folks live in wealthy neighborhoods. Let's, let's not act like black people ain't got money, especially in Atlanta. 
Atlanta got some of the flashiest Negroes I've ever seen. <laughs> Atlanta is like a mix between the rich and the ratchet. The rich and the ratchet. They need to call it. This should be a TV show. Gentrification. Okay. ROI is lower. Uh, could be. Could be. Keep going. Come on. They need the poor people to down their debts. Okay. Uh, all right. So let me give you my, let me give you the Dr. Boyce answer. Let me give you the Dr. Boyce I could have told you the Dr. Boyce, the Eastern European Jews are the biggest investors in that type of business. Yeah, yeah. Well, Eastern European Jews, Norman, um, there's a book that I tell all the students in the Black Business School to read called um, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. And it's not anti-Semitic at all. I, you know, when I sat on the phone with Kanye West all that time, I told him I don't agree with him on constantly talking about Jewish people, not because I agree with everything they do, but because I'm not, I don't hate the player. I don't even hate the game. I just learned the game from the best players in the game. And the Jewish community is among the best players uh, in the economic game. And, uh, and the book is the book, um, how the Jews invented Hollywood is a beautiful, uh, deep dive into exactly and precisely how the Jewish community uh, overcame some of the discrimination they were facing by pooling their resources and building Hollywood. And uh, and that's something that I think black people can do because there are more of you. There are about four times more black people than there are Jewish people. Uh, you've been here longer, so you understand the terrain better. Uh, also, um, the, you have uh, more talent than almost anybody else on the planet. So so entertainment industry can't be fueled without black talent. The sports industry can't be fueled without black talent. So you have more talent than everybody else. Uh, and the other uh, component to that is that you um, you have some celebrities out here that have a lot of money. The problem is the mindset. The problem is getting everybody to understand the importance of kind of operating this way. You have to change your culture. You know, a lot of this hip hop culture that's teaching black people to just be stupid with their money, that is incredibly, incredibly destructive. And But generally speaking, black people can do this. And we're actually doing this. We're not just talking about it. I'm not a guy that just gets on the Internet and runs his mouth. We actually just finished another film. Uh, we spent three years on a movie called B1, the movie. And director Rick Mathis and I got together and I said, I really want to document this powerful movement that's going to that's making black history. So we got some of our favorite uh, people in this space. These are my movie stars. Uh, Rizza Islam, uh, people like Nuri Muhammad, uh, Queen Afua, uh, Dr. George C. Frazier, Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, Vicki Dillard, Madam President. You know, we, we got Julian Gordon. Uh, we got so many people across the board who are leaders in this movement. And the movie is going to come out. We're going to do a sneak peek in Atlanta for the Juneteenth Festival. I forgot. I don't know what the festival is called, but Rick is going to show it there. Uh, he's the director, so I respect him in that regard. And then um, we're also going to do a red carpet event at the All Black National Convention, which is going to be October 20th, again, in Atlanta. Uh, so if you'd like to go to the convention, just go to allblacknationalconvention.com, or you can go to voicewalkins.com. I'll put the information there, too. Uh, but anyway, let me let me keep going here. So so basically, the, the, let me answer this question. Let me answer the question. Okay, I, I see that's what happens. My Y'all got to forgive me. I hope y'all can forgive me. I have a little bit of ADHD. Because like when and when I get excited, it's like you know how you have a dog when he starts getting excited and jumping up and down, he pees on the floor. Like I'm kind of like that, except I don't actually pee on the floor. But I get excited and I start going on tangents because there's so many opportunities and possibilities that I believe that we can accomplish as Black people. I think there are so many things that Black people can do, and there's so many opportunities for us. Remember, every problem is an opportunity. <laughs> problems are not obstacles. Problems are opportunities. So anyway, uh, let me move back into this. Let me tell you why. Let me answer my question. Calm down, boys. Here's why I believe they don't go into white wealthy neighborhoods. Um, the reason they're not able to acquire property in wealthy neighborhoods is number one, wealthy people tend to be wealthy because they understand how to accumulate wealth. Let me say that again. Wealthy people tend to be wealthier because they understand how to accumulate wealth. What does that mean? That means that they understand that keeping wealth means you don't sell unless you have to. So let me tell you what happened with my property in Atlanta. My wife and I own a property in Atlanta that we bought in 2021. One of those corporations called me. They texted me. I don't know how the hell they got my number, but they were texting me. They're like, hey, boys, uh, we were thinking about acquiring some properties in your neighborhood, and we were wondering what sale price you would have, you, you want for the property. So, so you know, my first response was, okay, is this a scammer, right? Because there are scammers out there. They're all over the place. On the Black Financial Channel, I talked about a banking scam that's kind of going on right now, so you guys want to be careful. So feel free to go to the Black, Black Financial Channel and take a look at that. 
and I said, but then when I realized it wasn't a scammer, I was like, um, no, I, I'm not selling my property to you. I just bought it. Why would I sell it to you now and allow you to get all the benefits that are going to come with time? I'm a finance professor. I know that this property I bought for $580,000 will be worth three quarters of a million dollars in just a few years, most likely. All I got to do is sit on it like a, a, a like a goose sitting on a golden egg. I ain't selling you nothing. So then, check this out. This is a real story. This is what's really happening. So then they they text me again, and this is this is me answering your question: why they don't acquire the property in wealthy neighborhoods. So then they 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 hit up, you know, they hit they hit me up again. And they're like, hey, Dr. Bush, hey man, we we just want to follow back up again and just see if you were interested in selling the property. Da, 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 da. That's a picture of me and my wife when we got engaged. I just think she's so pretty. I like to look at her while I talk. So I hope that's okay. That's just that's like that's like a drug for me. You know, the you know black women y'all so pretty. I just it just makes me feel good to look at my at her pretty face. All right, so so they were so they were like, hey, do you want to sell your property? And I was like, why would I, I? I told you two months ago I didn't want to sell it, but I was like, since you're asking, you know what I did? <laughs> I took the price that it's worth. The price is, you know, it was worth I don't know. Let's say right now it's worth six hundred k or something. Like that. That's what it's assessed for. That's what I'm paying taxes on. And I said. Yeah, you could buy it for eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> he didn't text me back, and then he texted me again the following month. See, so they have a process; they just hit everybody up every month, and every time they hit me up, I'm like, "Yeah, the price is still the same. You keep asking, the price is gonna keep going up. If you want my property, you're either not gonna get it, or you're gonna have to pay a price that's gonna make me feel good about selling you my stuff." See, that's the thing. That's why they can't acquire property in wealthy neighborhoods. It's because, number one, rich people understand that getting rich requires not selling your stuff. Black people, just like you sold your hip hop. You had hip hop. You were sitting on a trillion dollar industry in the South Bronx. You sold it. You know, you, just like you, you, a lot of you, will sell, you, sold, you sold your granddaddy's farm. You know, because you needed some extra cash. A lot of us sell ourselves every day on the corporate plantation. So, so when, so when they're reaching out to buy stuff, what they're doing is they are basically engaging in a Warren Buffett rule of wealth, which is wealth is simply a transfer of assets from the um, from people who have uh, instant gratification to people who have delayed gratification. That's what wealth is. It's it's a transfer of, of resources from people who think short term to the people who think long term. So if you are a short term thinker and you're like, wow, look at that. I can get all this cash right now, man. I can have all this money. I can go on vacation. I can buy me some Yeezys and do whatever I want. Then, yeah, you're going to be an easy victim. You become easy prey. Now, again, now here's the thing. I, I didn't answer that entirely, though. Uh, accurately, that's another pretty picture of my wife. Ain't she, ain't she, ain't she, ain't she just so hot? Anyway, um, see, they, you know, I... I God bless the late Kevin Samuels, but one area where I had to put my foot down was when he said women, you know, when they get past 35, nobody wants you. You're not attractive anymore. And I just, I, I got mad. I said, that's a bunch of BS, man, because I was a guy in my 40s who could have dated, I could have dated a 25-year-old if I wanted to. If you got money, you can kind of do whatever you want, to be honest with you. I'm just going to be honest. When you're, when, you're, when you're like rich and famous, it's easy to convince someone that you're a great catch, even if you're not. I, I think I was a good catch, but seriously. And I was, I'm going to tell you, I told my friend, I said, I think women hit their peak in their late 30s in terms of attractiveness. Now, now for fertility, yeah, you should be having your kids younger, like in your 20s. That's the ideal time to have a child. But women like about 39, 40, 41, 42 and beyond, they, they, they have found their look. They are. They tend to be more health conscious. They don't just look good just because they won the genetic lottery. They look good because they're working out and doing all these other things. They've learned themselves sexually. They know what they want. They know how to. They know. They know how to figure out what you want. They. It, I. I literally said. I. I said. You know. If I, if I had a choice, I'd rather date a woman that's like in her 40s than than younger. Now, of course, if I was in my 20s, I would have thought differently. I want somebody my same age. But the other benefit I found was. I enjoy talking to someone who is at my level, right? Who's my same age, where I can tell them a story about the 1990s and they won't think I'm somebody's grandpa, right? So effectively, 
Um, you know, I just really want to make a point of that. I know this is a little bit off the topic of what we're discussing, but y'all know how I am. I, I, y'all, y'all know how I eventually get back to where we were. But generally speaking, I just really think that we got to kind of challenge some of these narratives that are overly simplistic. That's my point, right? Like, 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 don't ever let anybody make you believe that because you're a certain age, uh, that you're not a good catch, or because you're a bus driver, <laughs> that nobody will want to date you, or because you're a little overweight, or a li- or you're not as young as you used to be, or whatever, right? Everybody can everybody can find somebody that's going to love you for what you bring to the table, and if that's if that doesn't work, then learn to the table. So that's my two cents. That's just something I want to say. And I hope it's okay that I say that. I, I you know, you guys know I get passionate about it. I kind of feel like it's. Um, I feel like black women sometimes get beat up on a little bit and I don't like it. And I don't like it when people beat up on black men. And I because I think that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen and investing actually uh, incorporates some of that. You know, that's why one of the things that my wife and I did, she's a therapist and she's a full professor of social work. And uh, she's a she's an expert on the subconscious mind. And uh, we created the first ever black financial therapy department in the black business school. So what we do is we explore things like financial anxiety. We explore things like financial trauma. We explore things like, um, you know, the, the, the different uh, financial infidelity even, right? Just all these different little topics that kind of explain why you view money the way you view it. Because when you go back to why these companies are able to go and acquire all this property and steal people's stuff the way that they do, a lot of it is due to the fact that we have a lot of instant gratification that can occur. And some of it is due to uh, a lack of training or a lack of preparation or bad culture, but then some of it might just be due to bad economic circumstances, right? The other reason that these big companies are able to go in and steal, not well, not steal, but able to acquire so much property, and they acquire it mostly from middle class and poor people, is because there are a lot of people who have uh, cash flow problems. Cash flow is literally like blood flow it's like the flow of water that's why they call money liquidity uh, you know so so basically sometimes you may have wealth but you may not have any cash and when you don't have cash then yeah it's very tempting to go ahead and sell that house even though you know you're selling it for below market value because your short-term problems have blinded you to the ability to maintain a long-term vision this is why one of the most important things black people must do in order to accumulate wealth is we have to find a way to get out of the business of struggle nomics and learn how to play the game of power nomics. Give me a yes if you understand what I'm saying. Struggle nomics is where you're living day to day. Power nomics is where you can live over the next 20 years. Uh, struggle nomics is where short term situations keep you away from your long term goals. Power nomics is where you rise above the short term situations so you can focus on the long term issues. Power nomics is what you play if you want to have generational wealth and generational legacy. Uh, struggle nomics is what you do when you're worried about the white man putting his foot on your neck and you're constantly trying to survive and you can barely breathe and everything else, right? And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen and I'm not saying that it's your fault. What I am saying, I'm not exonerating white folks for their part in creating this environment. So let's just be clear. I am not uh, uh, some Trump supporter or whatever. I'm, I'm not none of I'm none of that. I don't vote Democrat. I don't vote Republican. I just vote black in every election. That's what I do. And that's what I'm going to consistently do for as, as long and until they until somebody writes a reparations check that makes sense at that point then i might actually cast my vote until then i'm not doing no reparations no vote period but anyway the point of the matter is to say that when you're dealing with all these stressors that are put into your life and then you define yourself as black people to be people that are supposed to be in the struggle so you you define yourself as people that are supposed to barely be getting by you allow people to put you into the victim box. Victim, 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 victim. Man, to hell with that. Throw that in the garbage. A victim cannot be a victor. A victor can a, a victim cannot win. All a victim can do is not lose. A victim can never play offense. A victim can only play defense. A victim will never have power. All a victim can do is stop somebody from, that has power from taking the little power that they have. I'm not no victim. I'm not interested in that. So because victimization, that victim mentality excuses you from doing the work and doing the planning necessary for you to engage in an effective strategy that's going to allow you to win this game of economics. Don't ever let anybody let you believe that being born black and poor means you're supposed to stay that way for life. No, it just means you have to adjust. 
it means you have to be able to pivot. Everybody can't pivot. Everybody can't pivot. And I understand that. I talked to Dr. Claude Anderson the other day, and I love this man like a father. He's the author of the book Powernomics. Everybody should go to powernomics.com. And at some point, let's just do like a uh, let's just rain on his website. Like, I think this man deserves our support. I think we should all buy his books and we should not just buy his books. We should buy extra books to give away to other people. Like the Powernomics should be the Bible for the black community. I've got my book out there. It's the 10 commandments of black economic power. That's out there as well, but I don't want you to buy my book before you buy his book. Okay. And one thing Dr. Claude Anderson told me as he was talking about his years as a soldier he told me uh, two hours worth of stories about his time in the Korean War and the horrible things that they went through. And God bless every single veteran in here. I thank you. I applaud you. I commend you for your service to this country because without you, we would have no protection. I will never, ever disrespect a soldier on this platform. And one thing Dr. Anderson talked about, though, was when he, he said when he went into the military that they, um, that they took an IQ test. And it turned out, surprise, surprise, his IQ was far above average. He had about 140, 135, 140 IQ, and the average high school graduate at that time had an IQ of between 90 and 100. And so as a result of that, he got a lot of special complex jobs because they knew that his brain could handle it. So what I'm simply saying to you is that, unfortunately, in this society, everybody doesn't have a high IQ. You know, not everybody um, is able to really process information the way some of you can process information. Uh, and, and, and what's even worse, is that you have a culture that encourages black people to be as dumb as possible. They pretty much say, look, if you're stupid, just stay stupid. We like it that way. You know, and then you have a culture that mutes and makes fun of people that show above average capability. So when I have gatherings of intelligent black people, when we do things like the convention and stuff like that, I'm doing that to basically say, no, we need to make black intelligence cool again. I don't want to cheer on the dumbest Negro in the room just because white people gave him money and put him on TV. They want you to have stupid leaders. They want you to have leaders that are bought and paid for. They want you to have leaders that will sell their grandmama for a nickel. They want you to have leaders that don't know what the hell the vision is. They want you to have leaders that have no solutions, only more victimization. That, I, I, that is something I think we must resist at every single level. In my opinion, I think we got to kill all of that. That's why I don't even watch TV anymore. If, you, if you're a Negro, they put on TV, that right there makes you suspect in my book until I can confirm that you're, that you're, that you're there for the right reasons. So, so the point of the matter is to say that when you're talking about these economic games and you're talking about cities like Atlanta where these companies are just buying up all the property, uh, they're prepared for the future. Their grandkids are going to be good. Their, their grandkids are going to be shareholders in the companies that are acquiring profits from the property and from black people. Let me say it again. Their, their grandchildren are going to be shareholders in the companies that accumulate profits from the property that they bought from black people. So the question that I want to ask you is, which side are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to be the victim or are you going to choose to be prepared? You got to make a choice. You know, and, and so here, here's one, a, a couple of ways you can be prepared. Number one. If you get an opportunity to buy property, you should do it as soon as possible. Also, you should teach your children as one of the fundamentals of wealth that property ownership is the key to power. In fact, the 10th commandment in my book, the 10 commandments of black economic power, the 10th commandment is that ownership is the key to power. Uh, being a renter is not power. Um, having a job is not power because that's not your job. Uh, it, all, all having a job is, even an important job, is, uh, is the uh, perception of power. Right? You, you get people thinking you have power but really it's somebody else's power. So if somebody ever fires you or gets rid of you, you can't pass that job to your children. You cannot pass that job to your family. You also have no um, say in terms of how that company is run. If they put you out, then they just put you out and they've wasted 20, 30 years of your life doing something for other people instead of doing something for yourself. So, so the, um, the other thing you could do to prepare is uh, these companies, a lot of these real estate companies, they raise capital from the public, which means anybody can get on an app and buy shares in these companies. I if you like real estate like that, then look, you know, do some research or look, just search, go on, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Robinhood or something and search REIT for real estate investment group, a real, real estate investment trust. And you will find a ton of REITs you can invest into right now that will allow you to make money as they're going around devouring up all this property from people that are having cash flow issues. Right. Uh, that's why they were that's why they text me every month 
is because they're trying to see if I'm having a cash flow problem and if I want to sell my house for cheap so I can solve a temporary problem. But again, because my PhD is in finance and I know more about finance than 99.9% .9 of the population, I tell them to fuck off because I'm not selling you nothing. That's my stuff. That's my legacy. That's my property. That's my power. I'm not giving my, my power to you unless I absolutely have to. OK, and, and, the, and the, one of the biggest things about investing that people don't understand, nobody really talks about this so much because everybody's into get rich quick situations, is that uh, one of the biggest things about building wealth isn't just the accumulation of wealth. It is the ability to protect what you've accumulated. It's the ability to protect and you protect your wealth in many, many ways. You protect it through insurance. You protect it through trust. But you also protect it through mindset. You protect it uh, by thinking about who you have around you. Even the women you sleep with is a form of wealth protection. Look at some of these rappers that are getting and these athletes that are getting sued for all, half their wealth, or because they got somebody made a, a an, an accusation, or or because they got a divorce or whatever, right? So all these things come into wealth protection, and part of protecting your wealth is also psychological. That's why we have the Black Financial Therapy Department in the Black Business School. Because if I was not in the right mindset, if I was not deeply entrenched in the culture of delayed gratification, then it would sound pretty tempting to hear somebody say, hey, we'll buy your $600,000 house for a million cash right now. We'll put that money in your bank account right now if you're just willing to let go of that house. Because I pay my mortgages down pretty quickly. I don't like a lot of debt. I pay my debts down pretty fast. And I and so that that loan is not that big. So if I wanted a cash injection so I could go and, and, and be part of, quote unquote, the culture, this is the nonsense that BET has been promoting to you for 30 years. If I want to be part of the culture, I could literally go get that get that half million dollar check, pay off that loan, have a quarter million in the bank and be the flyest dude on the block. The flyest dude on the block driving the nicest car with the baddest chick. With the, with the nicest, I, I got Gucci, Prada, Louis, Hennessy, Henny in the back, whatever it is, whatever stupid stuff rappers taught you to idolize, I can have all of that. But again, it comes down to culture. That's not part of my culture. Being flashy is not a part of my culture. Uh, Henny and Louis and Gucci, that's not part of my culture. Uh, you know, uh, instant gratification is not part of my culture. I did not become successful by always doing what felt good in the moment. I, I, I've changed my success through sacrifice, but I knew a lot of guys when I was in college. I knew a lot of guys and some women, too, where all they were into was whatever felt good in the moment. If she looked good, then you're going to go sleep with her. Next thing you know, you got six kids and, and 10 million problems and five babies, mama screaming at you, taking all your money and and all that for an orgasm. You know, or they would go to every party. They would go to all the parties and all the step shows. And I, I, I was like, I don't I like step shows, but I don't like step shows more than I like preparing for my math test. You know, so so ultimately, this is a cultural battle. And one of the things I talk about a lot in the book, and I, and I hope you'll consider taking a look at it again. If you're not sure if it's good or not, just read the reviews. I, I have I do not know the people who made the reviews in this book, uh, but the reviews are very good. Ninety percent of them are five star. Most of the rest are four star. And then there's like one what I think there was just literally one review that was low and I don't know why what was going on with that person, but everybody else liked it. It's probably a white person that bought it and didn't know what he was buying. I have no idea. Either way, though, um, feel free to take a look at the book. It's on Amazon. Uh, these rules of wealth are not complicated. It's like um, building wealth is like. In weight or exercising or getting in shape, you don't have to be a fitness expert to lose weight. You don't have to be a fitness expert to get in shape. You just, you just have to do basic things. If you go to the gym every other day or you run two or three miles every other day, then you won't be fat. You, know, that, you can't be fat. You can't be fat if you run three miles every two days. That's, that's my logic. That's what literally led me to literally look better at 51 than I looked at 41. I just realized, wait, you know what? If I just stick to this one rule, then everything fixes itself. <laughs> you know, so, so the thing about wealth is that a lot of times there's like one rule, maybe two rules that will literally separate you from everybody else, you know, and, and don't go. So don't go and, you know, listen to somebody that's going to try to impress you with long words and fancy concepts. Uh, I don't have to impress you. I like I know I have a Ph.D. It's from the Ohio State University. Like, I know I'm smart and I know I'm good at this stuff, so I don't have to prove it to you. I, you, you, I think I've earned that trust. So my goal is to make it as simple as possible to just say, look, just do this one thing and your kids will never have to work again. 
or just do this one thing and your family will have 10 million in wealth in, in the next generation and a half. Or do this one thing and you'll get financial security. It might take some time, but you'll get there. Right. Literally. So uh, one example of one thing that you can go grab in terms of solutions uh, on my website, I have something uh, called the five dollar a day investing plan. And uh, it is it's so easy that a five year old could do it. And it, the, the thing is that you need to make sure you do it as soon as possible, because the biggest ingredient is time. You have to plant your seeds so your flowers will grow. So ultimately, if you want to go take a look, just go to boyswalkins.com. The five dollar day investing plan is right there. There's a book on it. If you want to have a hard copy book, you can get the book on Amazon, but don't buy it on Amazon. You can just get it for free on my website. Uh, and so feel free to go take a look at that if that will help you in terms of this wealth game. Uh, just to conclude on this topic, let me go, let me go ahead and finish up on this. Because uh, I'm with my family and I want to go and uh, spend some time uh, with them today. Um, uh, so here's some other things. So the Atlanta Journal Constitution, they mentioned about all the houses being bought in uh, in Atlanta. They said others, like the five largest owners depicted here, bought them by the thousands. So there are some companies out there that are buying these houses by the thousands uh, because that's how corporations operate. They tend to do things in bulk. Capitalism is in inherently a greedy and oppressive. So just understand that, you know, that they're not playing. They're, they're coming in with billions of funding. Uh, a lot of that cheap free money that they were getting from the government over the last 10, 15 years where interest rates were near zero. They're using that money to come and acquire your property. Uh, and, and they said in all, uh, large investors own more than 65,000 homes today. And that's in Atlanta. 65,000 houses in Atlanta are owned by corporations and they plan to keep on buying. But again, remember, this is not just Atlanta. This is also happening in New York. This is happening in Wichita. This is happening in Seattle. This is happening in, uh, you know, in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> this is happening in Miami. This is happening in Dallas. It's happening everywhere. And this is just the trend. So you're going to have to adjust to that. Now, the beauty of this trend is that I'm telling you right now that these prices are going to go up. These prices are going to go up. What does that mean? That means that if you're in a position to go ahead and fix that credit or learn how to acquire some property, acquire that property so that when these companies come in and they push these prices up, they, they create inflation by increasing demand with a, with a constant supply. You can benefit because you'll already own those assets. And then you'll be in a position where you'll have financial security, where you'll have an asset you can borrow against, not necessarily sell. Because remember, a lot of wealthy people don't sell anything. They, they buy, they borrow against it, and then they die. And then when they die, they pass it to their kids, and their kids don't pay taxes on any of the capital gains that they acquired during their lifetime. That's one of the wealth hacks that the rich use. They literally buy, borrow, and die. They buy assets. They accumulate lots of stuff. That's how they become rich. That's how you know the difference between a rich person and a poor person. The rich person has a lot of stuff. Because Why? Well, because they've been accumulating stuff. They've been hoarding. They've been buying. They're acquiring things, right? And then they borrow. They borrow against what they own. They don't sell it. They need cash. They don't say, well, let me go sell the house. Let me go sell the blah, blah, because they know that's going to lead to a taxable event. So what they do is they borrow against it, and they use it as collateral, and they use that to pay to live their best life. They're not working by this point. A lot of uh, people, uh, for some reason, people fed you a myth that says that working is the best way to make money. Uh, there are some reason people taught you that in order to make money, you actually have to get up and go to work every day. I don't know who fed you that myth, uh, but that is a working class myth. Uh, and I think the only reason I probably see it differently is because I know a lot of people who make more money not working than most people make going to a job every day. So uh, and so just to help you, if you want to take a look, I have a training on my website, boyswalkins.com, called How to Make Money Without Working. Some of you have seen it. I think you're going to like it. It's really good. So feel free to go take a look at that. Let me finish the last slide because I got I to gotta get out of here. Every time I get getting here, I always promise myself that I'm going to uh, talk like for 10 minutes and then I talk for like an hour, but whatever. Uh, anyway, the uh, other thing I want to mention to you guys is that this podcast is on Spotify. So if you go to Spotify and look up my name, uh, Boyce Watkins, you'll find the Dr. Boyce Breakdown. And I put a lot of this content on Spotify as well. So if you're in your truck or driving or working out at the gym, you can listen that way too. Uh, the other thing I want that I have is a resource that you can pick up. Feel free to pick it up. Is uh, I talked today on the Black Financial Channel about what's going on with AI stocks. Has anybody been following the chaos with NVIDIA and the AI stocks? Has anybody seen this? Give me a yes if you've seen this. If you saw NVIDIA just literally rocked the world with, I wish I had a screenshot of NVIDIA stock right now and what it's been doing lately. NVIDIA has been doing backflips in my portfolio. Uh, and mainly it's because NVIDIA, they're just the bosses of AI right now. Like NVIDIA just literally put themselves in a position that's hard to emulate. I almost look at them like they're like the Tupac, the Tupac Shakur of of the of the the chip industry. Holy crap! 
Oh my God. I'm looking right now at a at, at NVIDIA stock. I wish I could take a screenshot for you guys. I can't, you know what I'm gonna do? I and nah, I can't I can't get it to you. NVIDIA stock has literally gone up 27% today. Oh shit. Oh my god, this is so cool. NVIDIA stock, has anybody seen NVIDIA? NVIDIA's in say it's gone up $82 today to 388, 27%. In the last five days, NVIDIA stock's gone up, well, 20, okay, 23%, so most of it's been today. The last month, though, it's gone up 50%. NVIDIA was a killer stock in my portfolio before today. It was actually one of my favorite stocks. It's gone up 138% in the last six months. Uh, year to date, it's up 171%. In the last year, it's up 128%. If you'd owned it over five years, it's uh, 5X. It's 523% ROI. Five years ago is 2018. That wasn't that long ago because I was talking to a lot of you in 2018. So here's the thing about AI that I want you to understand, and I want you to write this down, listen, share this with your friends if they want to make money. AI is not going to go away. Um, AI is the new gold rush. AI is going to change the world. The companies that control AI, and NVIDIA is right there at the top, those stocks in the next five to 10 years are most likely just going to go berserk. They're, gonna, they're just going to fly like crazy. Um, NVIDIA at 388, uh, actually when it was at 381 earlier today, they asked one of the analysts who follows NVIDIA very closely, they said, are you recommending to your clients that they buy more NVIDIA even at 381? He said, yes, yes. So if you haven't invested, and, and I hope you have, because I've been talking about this for a while. Anybody who follows me, especially if you're in stock class, because you know we do stock class every single Tuesday. So uh, feel free to go to my website if you'd like to be a part of the class, send me questions, all that. That's what my students can do. And there's a free trial if you want to try it out. Um, I've been talking about this stock for a long time. And another stock I've been talking a lot about is C3.ai which is another company that shot like crazy because of NVIDIA. So um, anyway, on my website, if you go to boycewalkins.com, I have a list of AI stocks that I believe are going to do well in the future. What I'm doing right now for my children is I am consistently every week buying stocks in that category on autopilot. So that means even if you can only invest $10 a week, $50 a week, whatever your number is, I think that's a good play. And I think you're going to see results in the next few months, maybe the next couple of years for sure. 2024 is supposed to be a great year for the stock market. You heard it here first. I hope that you apply this information because I want you to do well and have money. And if you want to learn how to generate income from those stocks, um, you know, with some of you, if you own a lot of stock, you can actually generate enough income where you can almost either quit your job or be close to it. Uh, feel free to join us in the Prime program. We're going to meet uh, Friday night. And that's where I talk about the way I make money by selling options on my stocks. And that's when I talk about making money without working. Uh, and it's better than real estate, honestly, because the, the, the just the rate of return is much better. Just this morning, for example, I own about 2,200 shares of C3.ai. And I sold the options for the next week on C3.ai at a really high premium. And I think I brought in like three or $4,000 or something. Like, And I literally, this is real money that really went into my account. So this can really be done. It's not hard to do. The hard part is kind of knowing how to manage the risk and knowing which stocks to pick. And that's what I love to help you with. So feel free if you'd like to join us. Uh, if you wanna get into the class on a low cost, uh, go to boycewalkins.com, watch the training called How to Make Money Without Working. And uh, at the end, I offer you a discount access if you want, would like to participate. All right, so anyway, guys, I'm out of here. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for listening and uh, hope you make a ton of money and uh, let's just keep being smart. Uh, so, um, so hit the thumbs up button, thumbs up, thumbs up. Share, subscribe if you haven't done it yet. Also, uh, don't forget the All Black National Convention is going to happen the 20th in Atlanta. Uh, we are going to show our new film called B1, the movie, directed by Rick Mathis. But in addition to that, uh, it's like a big family reunion. I think you're going to love it. So feel free to go to allblacknationalconvention.com. And if you ever want to market on this platform, we do uh, allow limited advertising for black-owned businesses that are doing good things in the world. So if you'd like to advertise here, just go to drboycefinance.com. Michael will take good care of you. All right, guys, please have a wonderful day. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you soon. Take care. Peace.